I'm really excited for this video. Today, we're going to be talking to a legend in PC gaming, puzzle game creator Everett Kayser, author of Sherlock and so many other addictive puzzle games. But not only does Kayser create great puzzle games, he was also the author of an assembler for the HP 85 and was instrumental in the creation of that 8-bit system, which not many people know a lot about. And in today's video, we'll be talking about the unique architecture of his games and what exactly that has to do with assembly language. My original plan was to cut this video into 15-minute chunks by topic, but Everett is such a good storyteller that I felt that doing that would be to ruin his stories. So instead, you get the whole interview, and I've placed chapter markers below so you can skip to the parts that interest you. But I bet you'll stay for the whole thing. For those of you who haven't played Kayser's most famous game, Sherlock, here's a very brief walkthrough to how it works. Those of you who are familiar with it already, feel free to skip ahead. Games of Sherlock come in many sizes. The classic game is six by six. So six rows, six columns, and six possibilities in each cell of the game. That would make it difficult to explain. So I'm going to go to the smallest puzzle type so we have something simpler to work with so I can do this quickly. In the upper right of this black area, we see this face on a green background. That's known. We know that this face goes in this cell. In these areas with the multiple houses, for example, we don't know what goes in here yet. We need to deduce it, and we deduce it from the clues. So all around the side here are various graphical clues. There's a text explanation of the clue at the top of the screen. So if we look here, we see that this clue is telling us that the blonde person face is two away from the face with the green background. So we could either eliminate this as a possibility, or select this one. Let's select this one. And we know that the yellow house is between them. Well, let's do it the other way this time and say that we know that it's not the red house and it's not the blue house. Therefore, it must be the yellow house. We know that the white haired man is to the left of the green face also. And once we've used a clue, we can get rid of it to simplify our game board. We know that the number two is two away from the person with the green face. That leaves us with this clue that says the red house is in the same column as the number one. Well, the number one is here, so the red house cannot be here, or number two is there. And the yellow house is here, so the number one can't be here. Therefore, this has to be a three, this has to be a one, this has to be the red house, and with only one possibility left, this is the blue house. And we get a small animation. So that's Sherlock, just one of the many puzzle games that Kayser has created. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't say that you could find all of these games, including their trial versions, at kayser.com. K-A-S-E-R.com. And lastly, as always, this video is not sponsored. I'm just making this video because I'm a real nerd and I love his games. On to the interview. Hi, we're here today with Everett Kayser of Everett Kayser Software, um, who has written some of the most amazing puzzle games. And I, I have to tell you, Everett, I'm a little starstruck to be here talking to you right now. Oh, stop it now. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I have played your games since at least 1991, possibly before a friend. Oh, come on. You're not, you're not that old. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm getting there. Uh, a friend gave me a DOS shareware version of Sherlock uh, back in the day. And then at some point you, you released windows versions and other games and uh, Mac ports and, and, and your games. I have grown old with your games. So let's put it that way. How do you think I feel? <laughs> uh, I can only imagine. How did you get started in the puzzle game world? That's a long story that goes way back. I'll try, to, I'll try to make it brief, though. When I was in college, working on my art degree, I came upon a column in Scientific American, math, the mathematical games column that they used to have. 
and it was it covered John Conway's The Game of Life. And I, I've always been mathematically inclined, and that fascinated me to no end. <clears throat> and one thing led to another, and through a long series of events that I will edit out, I ended up writing a low-level computer program to calculate the next generations of the game of life. And that led me into programming at an early time in the around 1978, probably, on a homemade computer. And I was working at HP at the time in production and as a technician. And HP was just starting to, was working on, the, the division I was working at was developing the HP 85, which was a small desktop computer. And it was eventually introduced in 1980. And I wanted to use it to write this game of life and calculate things. So I got involved in that. And of course, at that time, arcade games were Pong and Pac-Man and those things were just coming out and those were lots of fun. So I started writing little trivial arcade like games on the HP 85 and eventually then the IBM PC was introduced and I got to work on that. And in the around 1980 or 19, yeah, 88 or yeah, be about 88, I think. I was introduced to a game called, uh, there were many versions of it, but it was what eventually I, I wrote a, I, there were things I liked about it, but there were things I didn't like, things I thought would work better. And I decided, decided to write my own version, which became Solitile. And when I got ready to release it, I thought, what the heck, why not release it as shareware, see if I get anything, which I did. And lo and behold, people started sending me money, which I thought that was pretty cool. So then I cast about and decided, I thought, okay, what is it about Solitile that people really like that, that, that I enjoy? And it was looking at the screen, having a bunch of things and click here, click there, click here. Not, not an action arcade game, but a puzzle game that you had lots of little details that you had to work your way through. And I thought, what can I do for my next game that would be sort of that same feeling? And as I stumbled around for a few weeks thinking about this and that and that and this, it took me back to my uh, days in high school, it'd be my soft, yeah, sophomore year in geometry. For whatever reason, the teacher introduced us a mimeographed copy of a puzzle that was in Reader's Digest that originally come from some other magazine, which is now known as Einstein or Einstein's Problem or goes by lots of different names, but it was Who Owns the Zebra and Who Drinks Water? And that, as I played with that idea, I thought, hmm, you could do that in graphics and have a bunch of images and you'd be sitting here, you'd you know, see these clues and you'd click on remove possibilities and it has some, kind of that same general feeling of as you solve the puzzle. And that became Sherlock. And that Sherlock and Solitile, those two were the, the start of my, my game empire. Well, I have to tell you, I'm a bit like a dog with two bones here because there are there are multiple angles of your story that fascinate me and I think will fascinate the viewers of my channel. So a lot of what I cover when I'm not talking about incredibly boring accounting uh, things is assembly language, in particular 6502 assembly language, because that's what I grew up with. Yep. And so there's this whole part of your history where you're working on the HP 85 which now is kind of nerd famous, right? For having this Capricorn CPU, it's very unique. And uh, it was a very interesting computer from a physical point of view. But at the time, I mean, when I was, however old I was in 1980, I'd never heard of the HP 85 at the time. So it never broke out. So that's one angle. The puzzle angle is a second 
the the simple simply the the number of games you've put out is stunning, and I think there are people who. I mean, I've I've read your games mailing list, so I, I know there are people who wake up in the morning and say, oh, I can't wait to play a Kaiser game. And then the third angle is you you've got a model for making and selling independent games that probably hundreds, if not thousands, of indie game makers have thrown themselves at and failed. Uh, but but I'm assuming maybe I should ask you this directly. Is it, is it your day job? Is it your business? Is it, is it a living? It has That's been fair. since 1997. I released solid, <clears throat> released solid pile in 89. And the first year, I think I made $1,200. And then the next year I made 3,600. And then the next year I made, I think around 11,000. And that, of course, Sherlock was introduced in that time period too. So for the first few years, it was my income from it was tripling every every year. It seemed like I thought, hey, this is kind of cool. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that tripling leveled off a bit. Um, but I I was still working at HP at the time as a software engineer, and the combination of my engineering salary from HP, my income from my games allowed us to pay off all of our debt. And so by 97, I decided sayonara HP and left to do this full time, which is what I've been doing since then. Now I'm in semi-retirement, so I'm not actively writing new games quite so much unless a fancy hits me. And so that's the course, course of my professional career. I get frustrated that you don't write new games, and it's not because I desperately want to play the games, although I do. It's because about every few years, uh, I'll get a new computer or some operating system up upgrade will happen. And I bought all your games you know, on a CD years ago, and then as new ones came out, I bought them. And every time I have this conversation with you, and I'm like, where do I send the check? And you're like, oh no, here you go. Here's a new job. And I feel like, no, let me give you, let me give you more money because the amount of uh, of value that I've gotten from playing these games over the years is is just incredible. Um, has that is that the limiting factor? Like a new game comes out and there's a spike. Is your fans all buy the new version or? Yeah, it's it's kind of a a steady level of orders most of the time. You know middling not not quite enough to live on but okay and then when i'd introduce a new game then there'd be a pretty significant spike that would kind of carry me over the top for the year let me let me pivot to talking about the technology and we'll work our way back to hp i think but but my okay. first my first realization that so so i'm going to be brutally honest your, your games have a certain look a very consistent look <laughs> and I would describe it as somewhat primitive. They're not quite eight-bit games. There, there, there are more pixels involved here, but it's hand-drawn art, and it's it's very kind of um, distinctive. I would say um, that, that, that's what you get when one guy does all does everything. Absolutely, <laughs> and, 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 and one guy isn't particularly artistic. <laughs> I just assumed that you were writing these uh, using a kind of straightforward game development. Life cycle, and then a few years ago, I think you released a game. Oh, it was the book game, if I Beckett's recall. Beckett's books. Yes, Beckett's books. In the course of that conversation, you explained to me that what, what's actually going on here is all the games are written on a shell, which is essentially an interpreter, yep. and that you're writing these games. I don't know if it's in an assembly-like language or something slightly higher level, and and you're basically running a VM, which is running these games. Could you? Talk a little bit about that. Well, I first moved to writing Windows games in the early mid nineties. <clears throat> and at first it was C, then Microsoft went wholehearted to C++. And then every year they had some new revision and thing, the whole development interface changed. Then they started pushing C sharp and it was just, you were on a treadmill. And I was getting along in years. You know, I was no spring chicken as a programmer anymore. 
And I was just tired of that crap, shall we say. I, for, for my purposes, I didn't need all these new bells and whistles and everything. I just wanted, I was writing my games primarily in C, still do. And I didn't need all those constant changes. I wanted a stable platform that I could. And then also from way back from the late seventies, all through the eighties, I did a lot of programming in assembly language. And there's a great deal to be said for assembly language in terms of focusing. You got to really focus on it and it's incredibly efficient, but you got to keep a lot of things in your head and, and there's a great deal of fun to it in some ways. <clears throat> there's also a great deal of drawbacks because it, it's very inflexible. I mean, it's hard to move stuff around. You better get it right the first time or it's a real pain to rewrite. But anyway, at the time in the, in the early 2000s, I just got fed up with trying to keep up with Microsoft. And I decided, hey, you know, why not implement a virtual a virtual computer design my own computer cpu everything that works the way i i want it to that supports my style of programming and my style of games and then just implement a small c interpreter program to interpret those byte codes those fake byte codes which of course people were developing java at you know along that same time and it was the same basic idea it, it was nothing new it was just mine it was my my development and once i got that interpreter developed and got the assembler written and the linker and various things then i could write my games in my assembly language assemble them and they would just run with i could ignore you know to microsoft i didn't have to keep updating my c compiler every year and then eventually that could be ported to other platforms. And eventually it was, it was ported to the Mac platforms. It, run, it runs on the Apple Mac also. And the, it's, it's the virtually the identical code in terms of my byte codes. It's, it's the exact same program that runs on Windows as runs on the Mac. And it looks exactly the same, which for a lot of Mac people may be a minus more than a plus, but you know, so it goes. So that went well for, oh, three or four years. And then I, you know, it's kind of, well, this has been fun, but assembly language is really is kind of a pain in the butt trying to deal with all of the details. I thought it'd be kind of nice to be able to write in C too. So I, I with some searching, I found a, a C compiler called LCC and it's a retargetable C compiler. Mm -hmm. And I decided, I, I don't know, don't know anything about C compilers. I didn't go to school for C compiler or for compilers or anything, but I thought, how hard can it be? Well, <laughs> it turned out, to be, turned out to be harder than I thought, but eventually I succeeded in porting this C compiler to output the assembly language for my pseudo assem pseudo virtual machine assembler so from that point on i started writing primarily in c again but still with the outcome being this virtual machine <clears throat> except now you have a little bit less efficient code so the interpreter has to fortunately computers kept getting faster and faster so at this point for my games which are not real high speed 3d kind of games, you know, 3D graphics, virtual reality kind of things. For my style of games, it works perfectly fine. Most You're, of uh, the time. Most of the time. Your platform is called Kint, if I recall correctly. Is that right? Yeah, or Kint. I, I just call it Kint. I have, a, I have so many questions. There's so many ways I can go. <clears throat> That's okay. Let me start with an easy one, which is... It what, did you model your virtual machine on anything that you would, I, I mean, I would imagine that if you're, you've already have a lot of experience in writing this assem various assembly languages. So my assumption would be that the Kint uh, instruction set would be something, would be modeled on something that you had done before. 
it was it wasn't modeled directly really but it was highly influenced by the hp85 capricorn cpu with a large register bank registers of different sizes uh, some similar instructions although not that's that's pretty loose uh mostly it would, i had written 8088 or 8086 assembly quite a bit too so it was, it was influenced by both the capricorn cpu and the intel cpu i would have told you that i knew everything about cpus in but you could have stopped right there that you well, knew, I, you I knew would everything have told you. i would have told you but the fact is that i had never even heard of capricorn until a few years ago so can you can we kind of spin a, a tail here and give us a little bit of of explanation of what made capricorn unique and where it came from what whatever happened to it why didn't why in your opinion it didn't really take off well or if it did, maybe maybe it changed into something else that's still around with a different name i don't know no no it it it, it lived a short life and was pretty much killed by the ibm pc as were hundreds of other microcomputers at the time um Basically, in the mid '70s, HP introduced. I think it was in possibly the late '60s or very early '70s, um, but I think it was like '69, '68, '69 somewhere. HP introduced their first scientific pro, scientific calculator, which was the HP 35, which was a red LED readout, and but it had sine, cosine, tangent square roots, you know, exponential. It was a scientific engineering type calculator. And it was the first really successful pocket calculator of that type. Um, and it sold for $400, which at the time was a lot of money. And I can remember when I, when I started college, I started in electrical engineering. And one of my professors, I think it was in a material science class, was he, he in early in one of the first classes, he pulled out his HP 35 out of his pocket and said, right here, yeah, this is a miracle device. My son works at HP and that's where I, I like to call this my color TV because it costs as much as a color TV. Sure. But at the time, that was probably the first time I'd ever even heard of HP. But HP, so HP started making calculators in, in the late 60s, early 70s, and they were developing those at the Advanced Products Division in the Bay Area in California. And by the time I graduated from college in 76, <clears throat> several years before that, they had decided that they needed to build a new division for these calculator, calculator products. And so they started, they had searched around and they decided to build it in Corvallis, which is where I, close to where I was going to school, where I was going to college. And at the same time down there in the Bay Area, this same division had started working on a desktop computer, which eventually became the HP 85. And so the Capricorn CPU really grew out of the calculator mindset and was the, the computer was originally intended to be kind of a super powerful desktop calculator. Mm -hmm. And then as, as it worked its way through R and D development, it turned into a full blown microcomputer mm -hmm. with a built in tape drive, a built in printer, built in CRT, no fan. It was low power. It was a, Great device. Anyway, the CP, this Capricorn CPU had uh, 64 registers. Everything was in octal, so I've got to kind of translate things in my head. And it had it had two byte. It had read the first it, lower registers were in two byte boundaries. You, you could act, and then that was for the first. I think that was the first 32. Let's see, 40, 50, 60, 60. Yeah, yeah. The 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 first 32 registers were divided into two byte 
groups and the last 32 registers were divided into eight byte groups. But you could, ask, you could access any of the registers as a single byte or you could start at any register point and say, do a multi-byte operation that would carry on from that point to the end of the, that multi-byte boundary. And the CPU could also do math in operate in binary mode or in BCD mode. And so at the time, many computers and calculators, if you did the square root of four, you would get 1.9999999 rather than two. Sure. Well, on HP's calculators, you got two, 2.0. And it was the same on the, cap, on the HP 85 because everything was done in BCD math. So there was no, you didn't have this binary, decimal to binary and back to decimal translation. And, and this, this sounds probably to someone familiar with today's computers like, well, what's the big deal? This is not typical for uh, CPU in the 1970s. Even, no. even if you'd stopped at the very beginning and just said the CPU had 64 registers, that would have been something in 1979 for someone to say, what? Yeah. Well, most CPUs had like three or four, maybe. There's one right there. <laughs> and a very small screen, right? Except, except it's in a clear plastic case. They they made these clear plastic cases during the development so they could see through it to see how the internal parts fit within the case. And I managed to grab a, a set of those clear plastic parts. So it comes out in 1980, and who buys it? Who who uses it? Is it is it used as a kind of glorified adding machine, a glorified scientific calculator? I see that. Or that was that was HP's problem was they really didn't understand who they were selling it to. I mean, it was it was developed as a general purpose computer by the time it was introduced, and but it was at the same time they had engineering application packs, they had business application packs, they had scientific business you know waveform analysis and data communications packs and all kinds of weird stuff. And they really didn't know who they were aiming it at. And it was pretty expensive. I mean, it was at the time in 1980, was, I think the in list price was $3,200. Yeah, that would be like almost, I want to say just off the top of my head, like eight or $9,000 in today's. Yeah, yeah. Now it was a beautiful machine. There's no doubt about that. But when the IBM PC was introduced in, was it 82 or something like that? it ate everybody's lunch mm -hmm. because it was reasonably cheap. It was, and I, th I think I bought an IBM, I think later on, like about 84, I bought an IBM PC with a color monitor, which was whoo, four colors mm -hmm. and dual disc drives. And I think I paid about around 3000 for that. But, but it was truly a, it was an open architecture that this was a proprietary, the 85 was a proprietary hardware all the way through. And originally they weren't going to have an assembler even for it. It was all programmed in basic. It was built into the machines. You turn the machine on about 15, 20 seconds later, boop, it's up and ready to go. But due to my interest in programming the game of life, I got, even though I was working in production as a tech, I got involved in, I went, I got into, I asked somebody to introduce me to the lab engineers because I wanted to learn how to program the thing in assembly language. And they happened to have a poor man's assembler that was written in basic that ran on the computer and was slower than the dick. I mean, it worked great for small programs, but it was really slow. And I, wrote some things on it, learned to program it in assembly, managed to implement the game of life to calculate the next generations quickly in assembly. And then one of the application or the primary application engineer asked me, Hey, could you, could you uh, turn some basic code into assembly code to speed up my, my waveform analysis? I said, well, I don't, I mean, I heard of waveform analysis when I was first taking electrical engineering in college, but I really don't know anything about it. He said, well, you don't need to know anything about it. All you got to do is just convert the algorithm. Mm -hmm. and I said, well, I we really don't know anything about floating point math either, but I suppose I could, you know, I, 
really all I'm used to, I'm just calling the system routines to do the math. So, okay, I'll give it a shot. So I did. And it turned into a 700 and some line assembly language program that took 30 minutes to assemble using this basic language assembler, which was painful because you make one little typo error, yeah. not even a bug in the program, just a typo. You type an O instead of a zero, run it through the assembler. And 30 minutes later, you find out typo, make the correction, another 30 minutes. So I finally, I, I got it done and it, it sped his, it sped his uh, routine up four times faster. But I decided my next project is going to be write an assembly language assembler. Right. And I was going to write it as a one you load into memory off disk. But the lab engineer said, hey, don't do that. Why don't you write it as a ROM? Because on the 85, they had all these plug-in ROMs that you could plug into a drawer in the back of the machine to add, expand the capabilities of the language. And for our younger viewers, we're, we could basically analogize this to the sort of like a cartridge you would put in a Nintendo game system. Although exactly. Our younger viewers have never seen a Nintendo <laughs> game. Maybe a Nintendo DS. They would have seen <laughs> So at the time, they had these prototype boards you could plug in the back of the machine. You could plug EEPROMs into that simulated a, a, a ROM rather than the manufactured production ROMs. So I said... Sure, why not? I'll do that because I can still use it with one of these boards. So I did, and this was in mid nineteen seven, mid to fall of seventy nine, before the machine was introduced. And I had I had the assembler pretty much. I'd go over and I, at night. I'd come home in the evening and I'd sit there and write a bunch of code on by hand. And then I'd go in early in the morning, go over into the lab and use. They had one. Hard, one hardware, it was a tower, six feet tall by two feet by two feet with all filled with breadboard, wire wrapped breadboards. And that was their, their prototype HP 85. It was the only thing they had at the time. So I'd go in early in the morning and type in my program and assemble it on their mainframe mini computer and download it into the prototype machine and try running it and debug it and and then rinse, lather, lather, rinse, repeat. Um, so by the time the machine was introduced in January of 1980, I had, the assembler was working. It wasn't finished, but it was functional. And a whole bunch of the marketing managers and, and head engineer, I mean, the lab engineers uh, and marketing engineers all went out to the field offices and the where they had various people from stores come in and they did what they called a new product tour. Went all around the world, mostly in the US, but also around the world. Two weeks, these all these people come back and, and do a post post tour debriefing to figure out, okay, what what did you hear? What did you hear? How did people react? What, what were they asking for? And a whole bunch, every, almost everywhere they went, people said, so what CPU does it use? Do you, is there an assembler? Well, they had no assembler. They had no plans for an assembler. But the uh, couple of the engineers in the lab knew that I had this assembler that I'd been working on. They said, we know somebody's got an assembler. And so all, <laughs> all of a sudden, I find myself giving demos of this prototype assembler ROM to the marketing head marketing manager, the head of R and D and eventually the uh, division manager. And I'm still working in production as a technician. So a few days later, all of a sudden I see people from the lab coming up to talk to my, my uh, production manager saying, we'd like to borrow your uh, technician for a few months. Is that okay? <laughs> so I ended up writing this, what, what became, what started out as a hobby project turned into a real product at, for the HP 85 and garnered me an offer to become a software engineer in the R&D lab. And 
that's kind of how the, how the court, I told you it was a long, complex story. <laughs> oh, this is great. This is fantastic. So anyway, the HP, the HP 85 was a seminal influence of my formative careers or form, formative years. And so it's, it's stuck with me ever since and was a big influence on my, the design I came up with for my, my own little byte code fake CPU. And that's, it's, it's kind of court. It's, it's carried over the entire, my entire adult life in, in a way. It's a fascinating story. And I do want to, by the way, give credit where credit is due. I first, like I said, I played your games for 20 years and I knew nothing about the HP 85 part of your experience until I want to say maybe two years ago, I was listening to a podcast called the floppy days podcast. And that was what kind of like blew my mind that, that there's all these things you did that were relevant to my interest beyond the game. <laughs> I, I want to ask a question and I, I have to imagine the answer to this has got to be, Oh God, no. But has it ever crossed your mind? Like, Maybe someone else wants to use Kint. Maybe I should make this a platform for other people to use besides me. Is, it, is that something you would ever think of doing? The answer to that is 42. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I have released the source code to it. And I, I would have no, if someone else wanted to use it, why they would want to, I have no idea. But if they ever wanted to, I would have no objections to that. Um, there, there's more to it though, than, than just the design and the interpreter. Once I had the design and the interpreter, it doesn't include any user interface. It doesn't, I mean, it, there's nothing, it doesn't use the, the host operating system to do menus and push buttons and dialogues and edit boxes and things like that. That is all done in my in order to make the in order to make the games portable everything has to happen in in that language basically so once i had the virtual machine interpreter written then i had to write a whole suite of basically the user interface portion of an operating system that implements menus and dialogues and all of that and that code i've never released as, as any kind of public code. That's not to say that I might not someday here in my retirement. Uh, there's things banging around in the back of my head that might lead down that path. But at this point, that's. But I, I don't see. I don't see anyone else wanting to use this. Um, there, are, the programming world has moved beyond my dinosauric way of doing things. It's um, a lot of what I tried to do in my videos is to de-romanticize assembly language. There are good reasons why these things, why these machines were built that way and why we program that way. And yep. occasionally you'll run into someone who's like, oh, you know, real programmers back in the day were working on the metal. And it's like, no, we were doing that because we were forced to at gunpoint and yep. we had better things. We've spent a really we've gone deep into the programming side of things. And I feel that people who enjoy the game part of things are, have maybe gotten sort of short shrift. So I've tried to rack my brains about what could we talk about on the game side of things that would bring something new that would give people insight into your mind. And I think I've got the perfect question, which is in your, your classic game, Sherlock, Surely one of your most popular, uh, if not, it's certainly it's the one I think many people are introduced to your games by. Yep. You have a number of different icons. It's a variant of what I think of as the dinner party puzzle. So-and-so, the person with the red wine is not sitting next to the person eating the steak. The person now, eating now, the steak. Now you're, now, and now that's you're dinner done. with Moriarty. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> But you have different icons, so there's different colored houses and yep. uh, different fruits. But on the top, the top row of your game are a number of faces. And the question I have for you is, when I play this game, I have a set of a very rich internal history and naming scheme for these people with their faces. I would like to know, what do you call 
these six people whose faces <laughs> are in your it, it's it's kind of interesting that I never intentionally didn't name them. It was just that, hey, they're graphic images. They don't need to be named. But as as you play the game, you kind of come to the realization that, well, yeah, you do think of them with names. You give them names. And it, it, but it wasn't until several years, probably five or six years after I introduced Sherlock, that it dawned on me or that, that I became aware that other people were naming them these characters and they were naming them differently than I did. <laughs> and so I see, I, I actually have multiple names for some of them because they, and, and the names are just whatever pops into my head. For example, the first one is this white fringe haired guy. I think of him as whitey. Okay. And it's not, not because he's a white person as opposed to a black person, but because he has white hair. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just the, the first thing that, that my eye catches and okay, he's whitey. Uh, then, then there's another one, which I call Mr. Green mm -hmm. because he has a, he's got black hair, but he's got, and, but he's yep. got the background is green and it's just, Sometime early in the game, I started thinking of him as Egyptian guy, even though because the green behind his head looks almost like a, a headdress, even though I'm sure yep. it's not. Yep. So. Yep. Um, th there's another one I think of as the brute. I mean, he was just supposed to be this normal guy with, with kind of a scruffy Gruff. beard. Yeah. But he, he turned out, again, you got to remember, these were low low resolution graphics on the original Sherlock. And then as I went to windows and higher resolutions, of course, I had to try to maintain the images somewhat. And even so, many people complained because what I came to realize again after many years of experience, both mine and listening to my customers, was that these games are so graphic, so graphically oriented that your, your brain gets used to seeing these exact arrangements of pixels. And if you change them in the slightest, it's like all of a sudden your brain goes, Aah! and you just can't, you can't solve the puzzles. It, mm -hmm. it makes it difficult to solve the puzzles because you're sitting here going, your brain is spending so much time trying to recognize and figure out the images that you're not focused on the puzzle itself. And it takes about two weeks for your, if you change the images, it takes about two weeks for your brain to really get, comfortable with those new images and settle down and say, okay, okay, I recognize these images now. A couple of, uh, a couple of times a year, not a couple times a year, every few years, I try and change the tile set. I say, well, there's community <laughs> tile sets. I'll try a new one. And I don't last very long because, you know, Lemonhead is not in the new tile set. Therefore, yep. I, can't, yep. I can't think about it. It, it. It's interesting that you say Lemonhead because that seems to be the common, most common name that I hear from people. I told uh, a couple of people, a couple of players of your games that I was going to be talking to you. I said, does anyone have any questions? And I got a really good one from a younger person who is very interested in knowing how do you ensure that all the puzzles are solvable? And I have some thoughts about how you probably do this, but I, I'd love to hear you explain. How, how do you know when you pick a random uh, some seed and you generate a new puzzle, how are you so sure that it's solvable? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. And I arrived at it out of necessity, by trial and error maybe. When, when I first developed Sherlock, I started out <clears throat> just getting the graphics going. Okay, I've got to have some images. So I quickly you know, I sketched in some rough people and some houses that quickly filled them with different colors and numbers and just the things that letters, things that I could do quickly just to get something on the screen. Because when I'm programming, I've got to have stuff on the screen. I, I hate sitting there and programming and programming for hours and hours and hours and then compile it and spend another hour debugging all the mistakes and then days debugging the logic errors. I want to get things that work quickly. I want to see something happen. So when I started with Sherlock, it was get some basic 
graphics going, get the layout working on the screen. So like, all right, there's the board. All right, there's there's the clues. The clues are working. I, I okay, I, I can I can now I got to click on it, images. All right, I can I can remove images. And so step by step, I got to where I could actually play it. But it was just totally random. It would it would scramble the positions of things and just throw up random clues based on those images, but they weren't solvable. Nonetheless, I got to the point where, okay, I can, I, I've got to that point. Now, what do I do? How do I guarantee that it's solvable? Well, what I, what I hit upon, which was eventually became the hint function, but it, the original release of Sherlock did not have hints. You, you were on your own. But buried in the program was essentially the hint function, which is, given this clue, what deductions can you make on the board? And so for each clue type, I wrote code that could search the puzzle, find any deductions that could be made based on that one clue. And then... Once you get to that point, you now have a block of code in the program that knows how to make all the deductions you need to make. And it becomes pretty simple to write a tight little loop then that just runs through all of the clues and repetitively applies them to the puzzle. And if you have enough clues of the right type, it can actually solve the puzzle. Okay, But that still doesn't solve the problem you asked about. And... So what you do at that point is you say, okay, now internally to generate a puzzle, what we're going to do is we're going to just throw a bunch of random clues at it. We're going to generate 200 random clues. I mean, it actually starts with 10 or 20 or 30. It depends on the, on the size of the puzzle and just generates a bunch of random clues. And then it, it runs it through the internal solver and it tries to solve the puzzle. If it can't solve the puzzle, if it gets partway but can't solve it, obviously we don't have all the right clues, so you generate some more random clues. Lather, rinse, repeat, until you get to the point where you've got enough clues internally that you can solve the puzzle, okay? So now you're, you're most of the way there. You've, you've, you've got enough clues, you can guarantee, I guarantee it's solvable with this set of clues. But you got a bunch of garbage clues. You even got a bunch of duplicate clues because it's, it's generating random clues. Later games avoided that by when it generated a random clue, it checked to see if it had already generated that clue. So it didn't have that problem. But nonetheless, you got a bunch of garbage clues. So what do you do? Well, it's pretty easy. You remove the clues one at a time and try to solve the puzzle. If you can still solve the puzzle, you throw that clue away. But if you can't solve the puzzle, that clue is necessary and you put it back. Go to the next clue, do the same thing. One trip through all the clues doing that, solving the puzzle multiple times in the process, you've removed all of the clues that are not needed and you're reduced down to a reasonably minimal set of clues. Now, the human play, in the case of Sherlock, it only looks at one clue at a time. It never combines clues. So the human player can frequently get away without using a clue because it, the human player can combine two or three clues and say, well, this has to be like this and that has to be like that. So this can't fit there. So I can remove all these things. And the, the program would never do that. So, but by doing that, you can actually remove a few more clues. Some of my other games do combine clues, two or three clues. And so there's added complexity in, in that sense, but that's, that's the basic fundamental. And that's, that's the, the overall general kind of algorithm for generating puzzles that I've used in many, many of my games is generate a random puzzle, generate whatever kind of clues or information needs to be done, solve and remove stuff that isn't needed until you reduce it to a minimal set. That way you're guaranteed that every puzzle is solvable, barring any bugs in the program, and away you go. This is fascinating to me because I would have sworn, my, my answer would have been, well, probably he generates the puzzle and then works backwards. 
to try and say, what clue can I give that will validate this? And then he's left with some set of clues. The pruning part would probably be the same in either case, whether working forwards or backwards. Yeah. Now, some yeah. of your puzzles, Sherlock is always a, what I think of, I don't know if this terminology is correct, as a strictly deductive puzzle. You're guaranteed, you sit down in a Sherlock puzzle, you've got a list of clues, from those yeah. clues, you know you can get there. Some of You're your guessing. Honeycomb Hotel introduces this idea of a what if, where, where you kind of have to go down, you may have to go down several branches without certainty that that branch leads you to a solution. Is that essentially the same algorithm or is there another wrinkle? There? No, it's, it's the exact same algorithm. It, it's just one extra step of take saying, what if this were true? It, it, because if you go back to the original, who owns the zebra and who drinks water puzzle, that puzzle is very straightforward. You can go through it and solve most of it, but you get to one point where you've got to kind of say, what if, I mean, if this were here, oh, that wouldn't work out. So then you got to go back and say, well, that can't be there then. So it, that has to be over here. And then you, it solves from that point. So that a lot of people consider the what if concept to be guessing but it really isn't guessing. You're still, you're still using cold, hard logic to solve the puzzle. Mm -hmm. It's just that you're using a guess, a, a, trial, a trial test to verify. Ideally, you're going to verify that something is false, that it can't, it can't be true. But sometimes you guess right, and the puzzle just solves. And then people say, well, that was just guessing. That involved guessing. Well, if, if you made some complicated visual clue saying, well, if, you know, both of these things cannot be true, then people would probably stop complaining. But because it's implicit, yep, yep. it upsets them. Yeah. Do, do you have a game that you view as a beautiful failure? Like, is, is there some game that you made that you thought you said, this is it, this people are going to love this one and it didn't work out? And why? Most of them. <laughs> I recall a few years ago, um, I cannot recall the details. Maybe you could fill me in on them. That, that Honeycomb Hotel, I want to say, was used in uh, a classroom setting yeah. to teach logic. Can you? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Barbara DeRose is, was, was using it. She was a uh, high school math teacher. And she, was using, she asked at the time, she had asked me if, if it'd be possible to, <clears throat> to create a a grading template. In other words, she would give the students the the puzzles, and they'd fill them in, print them, print you know a, a printed thing they'd solve. And she wanted a template that she could cut out the holes for the correct answer and just lay it over their paper and see if they had it right or not, or if there were any mistakes. So that that's true. Honeycomb Hotel was used in some classrooms. Uh, Sherlock. And a number of my puzzles have been used in several, um, the first words that come to mind is mental health facilities, but it's not necessarily mental health. It's, it's facilities. There's one in Israel. I think there's one down in Arizona somewhere, one in Texas that they, they treat people that have had brain injuries and are trying to recover their function functions and they find that Sherlock and those types of games help tremendously in that it because it's exercising their brain in ways that's difficult to get those people to do otherwise. And they've they've reported that they've had great results using them in that in that way. Which I never intended that, but it's certainly pleasant to hear that they've been useful to people that way. Do, do you have a favorite game among your? Well, Sherlock is, is probably, I, I, I wouldn't say favorite, but some, there's no word for it, but some combination of favorite and fondest. It, it's, it's, it's the game that I feel 
uh, I kind of created from scratch. Solitile was, had been, there'd been many Mahjong games before that. And it was just my version of a Mahjong game. And there were things I added to it that hadn't existed before my version. I think it turned out well on a lot of people. It was very successful. But Sherlock was mine from the get-go, other than the idea of that type of a logic puzzle came from, obviously from elsewhere. But in terms of doing it graphically, it was all mine. And it was wildly successful. And I think I have a con, what I call the sweet spot, which is something that can't be, it's, you can't define it, but you know it when you see it. When you hit it, you know it. And to me, Sherlock hit the sweet spot. It's There's a lot of games that I like that hit my sweet spot, but they don't hit everybody else's sweet spot. So they don't hit the sweet spot. Right. The sweet spot means that lots of people really like them. And Sherlock hit that sweet spot. Many of the other games that followed Sherlock in the Sherlock series, excellent games, and I like them a lot. I'm proud of them. But very few of them hit the sweet spot. Some mm -hmm. came closer than others. Uh, some were kind of in the middle of the series. There were several games that I was trying for something that I didn't quite know what I was trying to do or how to get there. Uh, it started with uh, Scotland Yard, mm -hmm. where I had, I was trying to do kind of a multi-level thing where there was, you could have different image, the images could be pretty much anywhere, but some images could only be in certain ways. And you had to figure, first you had to figure out what type of image went in this location. And once you did that, then you had to figure out which specific image went in that location. And then Inspector Lestrade, I think, came after that, which was a, another, again, working on that same concept. Eventually, I got to where I was trying to get, I guess, which was that any image could be anywhere. In Sherlock, all of the people are in the same row. All right. the houses are in the same row. So it was very, the images were scrambled, but it was still pretty regimented. In the later Sherlock games, it really, the image, you didn't necessarily have to have rows of images and rows of numbers and houses because there were no rows. There were things where it could be in any weird shape and any image could be anywhere. And when you selected a clue, it then showed you the locations where that image was still possible. Right. And I was happy with how that eventually turned out, but it's those games still don't hit the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. because now they're not as quick and easy to play. There's a, see, there's a lot of things about- A lot of UI spot. complexity it's also. How yeah. much do people like it? Is it complex enough to be interesting to most people, but not too complex? It's And does it take just enough clicks that people will put up with it, but not too many clicks? It, it, it's just oh. trying to hit the- You've got to come up with an idea for a puzzle that you haven't done before and one that hits the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And that's incredibly difficult to do. So all you can do is just keep coming up with puzzle ideas and, and implementing them. And f the problem is that frequently you don't know until you've already put all the work into implementing it, where you've got it up on the screen and it's working and you can actually try playing it and go, well, gee, that that doesn't work as well as I thought it would, but now I've put all this work into it. So I may as well finish it. Sometimes the, sometimes the things that are frustrating about your games are also the things that are fun about your games. I mean, I think of Watson's map as being one where I'm constantly misremembering what the word above means <laughs> with respect to groups. And, and, and I would, I would probably say, you know, objectively that, that's a flaw in the game, but at the same time, it also keeps me up at night coming back and thinking about it. So it, it's, it's a tough, tough call on that. It, it, it adds a little level of complexity to it, to the game, which, and again, that's that balancing for the sweet spot is complex enough, but not too complex. So one, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about the music 
in your games because I know that for, again, for every player I know, I will walk in a room, I'll go visit them and, and, and I'll hear, I'll hear that, that MIDI piano playing, uh, you know, a Chopin etude or something. Do you want to talk a little bit about who recorded those or, or who uh, recorded the MIDI tracks? And- Some of them were freebies off the internet way, way back. And then uh, a number of them were recorded by the wife of a cousin of mine, first cousin. She's a long, she's played orchestra, she's played uh, organ in church most of her life. She's been a piano teacher all of her life. Uh, very good pianist. And so I, one day I, I talked to him, one day I went up to their house and just sat there and recorded her playing a whole bunch of these classical music. And the reason I chose the classical music and all of this is that way I don't have to pay royalty on them. Everett, I wanted to thank you for being so generous with your time. And I wanted to thank you for making these games and, and bringing so much joy to many people. I know that that some people might think that these are, you know, it's just a game. What's the big deal? Um, like crosswords, like puzzles, puzzles in general, they, they occupy a big space in a lot of people's, I think, uh, intellectual and emotional lives. And, and I think that you've, you've brought something, you've brought part of yourself to that. And I wanted to, I just wanted to say thank you directly for, for the work you've done. Thank you. Very kind words. Obviously, they've uh, fulfilled that same itch in me that my, my customers play the games, my game is writing the games. <laughs>